Hi, I'm Mike Mahoney and I'm a professional bowl maker. Today I would like to introduce to you one of the most original tools developed for wood turners in over a hundred years, the McNaughton Center Saver. The Center Saver has been a very important tool for me in my business because I can get cores out of the inner pieces of my larger pieces and make those viable bowls for sale in my business. Today I would like to share with you the techniques that I've learned over the years and make you proficient at the tool as well because I think you'll see the huge economic and ecological value of the tool. Let me get finished up here then I'll show you the components of the tool. This is pretty much the full array of tools that comes with the McNaughton Center Saver. We have a micro system that works with diameters from about 10 inches and smaller. And if you only have a miniature lathe, these are the blades for you. It does nice, delicate coring. Then we have a smaller version of the tool that works with diameters from about 12 inches and smaller. Then we have the regular system, which will take cores out of 17 inch diameter bowls. I use these tools more than any of the others on a daily basis. I find them very durable and very easy to use. Then we graduate right into the larger version of the tool and these will take cores out of 22 inch diameter pieces. However, that depends on the plunge that you take. Then we have a parting tool that comes with each system of the tool. And if you've ever tried to part side grain timber, you'll know this tool will actually do that job better than any other. And we'll do that and I'll show you how that works. Then we have the tool rest post, which is called the turret by the manufacturer. Now, Kel McNaughton developed this tool, and I don't believe he can do any better with the design that he's got here. It's pretty much at its pinnacle. Now, we'll set this tool up, and we'll talk about how all these connect together, and we'll talk about the little nuances that will make this tool work for you as well. One of the keys to success in coring and just about any other form of wood turning is how we have our bowl blanks secured to the chuck. And in this case, I've got a 12 inch bowl blank that has a tenon that's about five and a half inches, which is roughly 45% of the total work area here. That's going to give me a good strong hold and very important with the coring tool because you put a lot of stress on your tenon. Well, let's take a closer look at the turret. As you can see, the turret has five pins, which represents four slots. For instance, if I have the micro blade here, it's going to fit nicely into this thinner slot that's highly elevated here. Now, the small version of the tool will fit into this slot. The regular version of the tool will fit into this slot, and this tall, wider slot will take the large version of the tool. What I'd like you to do when you first get the tool is set up the system and then put the blade through the tool rest support and the correct pins. Then you can lock it up, get it good and tight here, then get the feeling of how the tool glides through those two pins. That must run through smoothly all the time. You do not want to put force like this and try to put it through the pins. You'll find friction there. So the tool must run efficiently through those pins while you work with it. While I'm working with the tool, I like the turret to run freely like this. The turret also has a set screw there that you can lock it into place, but I've never really found that that works good for me. Okay, to set up the tool now, I'm going to choose the curve that's appropriate for my coring job. All the blades will be done just this way. I put it through my tool rest support here, put it in the corresponding slot that fits with this tool, and then I'm going to loosen my turret, and then I'm going to make sure the tip of that tool drops right at the dead center of that blank while the tool is locked underneath the tool rest support here. Then I'll tighten it up good and tight, and that's exactly the elevation that I need for coring. One of the biggest problems beginners have with this tool is while they're working, they'll let the tool drop underneath the tool rest support, and when you hit the wood, you'll get a catch. Therefore, Kel McNaughton has built in this nice latch that locks the tool 
down up underneath the tool rest support so you can't drop it while you work and it still runs nice and smooth through the slot here. A great innovation. Now a new feature of this turret is this little tool rest support here that goes into a hole right here on top of the turret. And what this gives us is the ability to do hollow forms with the turret on a captive system. Therefore, if you're going to do hollow forms, your tool will sit onto this tool rest support and be captured underneath this. Therefore, we're not getting any upward torque while we work. An incredibly good idea. And now you're getting two tools for the price of one, a captive hollowing tool and a coring tool. A couple recommendations I have when you're just setting up this tool for your first time is I wouldn't use a fancy bit of burl to get started. I would get a scrap piece of wood to build up your skills before you get onto that prettier wood. A couple other things I'm thinking about is am I trying to achieve a fancy nested bowl set like this one where I've tried to get as many bowl blanks out of a chunk of wood as I can? Well, I would have used a series of different blades to make that happen from the large, the regular, the small, and the micro blades just to make a bowl set like this. However, if I'm just trying to get a couple bowl blanks out of a pretty piece of wood, I don't have to be that accurate. Perhaps maybe I'll just get the regular set here and use this tighter curve to get this little bowl out here and this longer curve to get the second one out. It's your choice. You have to choose the blade that corresponds with the job at hand. Okay, I've got a set up here with the regular set of blades to take the two bowl blanks out of this main piece. I've got the tight curve and I've got the medium curve. It's possible that one of these curves can do both of these bowls, but we'll see as we go. Now notice one thing of the design of this tool. The front or the tip of the tool is wider than the shank. So theoretically, you can actually push this tool through in one pass, but more often than not, you'll have to widen the kerf as you go to get the chips to come out, depending on the timber, because some timbers are easier to core than others. Let's talk about how I got to this process so far. Originally, this was solid straight across, and there was a screw hole right here where this solid bit of wood was. Basically, I've scooped out the interior of the smallest bowl and gotten rid of the screw hole. Now, I've outlined the two bowls that I'm getting out of this main blank. Now, this thickness here represents the drying thickness that I need for the drying process. So, basically, 10% of the total diameter of the workpiece needs to be thickness that I I need for the drying process. Now, that thickness also represents the thickness that I want to be below this elevation here. So that's shooting for the direction that I'm going. So I want to go through this smaller bowl, this thickness below this elevation right here. And the same thing goes on the second bowl here. Okay, now that I've chosen the blade that I want for taking this little bowl out here, what I'm going to do is put the tool through the tool rest support in the correct slot that I need. Then I'm going to get the tool a little closer here and I'm going to loosen the turret, drop the tool down so it hits right at the dead center of the bowl blank. Now I'm going to move the turret closer to the wood, but now notice one thing, this is very important that beginners miss. The tool here is thinner than here. So if you touch the wood, and you have the turret right next to the wood and it touches the wood, what will happen is it'll have a tendency to roll on you here. Okay, and you don't want that because there's a lot of play. But if you have the tool back perhaps about an inch and three quarters and you touch the wood when the tool is engaged completely through, you don't get the play. Look at that, there's hardly any rocking motion there. So as you start, I would start back from the wood go in a couple inches and then move the turret closer to the work to give you a deeper plunge if you needed it. Okay, let's take our little bowl out here now. The way I've got to set this up is I've got to drop the tool through the tool rest post and put it in the appropriate slot, of course, like we've talked about. Now, I want to go that thickness right there below that elevation. Now I have to set up a trajectory and I have to use my imagination a little bit here because I have to draw a line past this curve and down below that elevation to match that. Now if I plunge in and I've gone an inch or two and I've decided I've gone too deep, I'm going to pull everything out and bring the tool towards me to take a shallower tack towards center.
but then I'll adjust my banjo so I'll go into the same groove that I've already cut. Let's give it a try. This looks about right, right there. Let's go. I'm about 600 RPMs here. Okay, notice I'm up underneath the tool rest post and I'm going to push the tool in straight ahead, nice and simple. I'm pushing straight ahead. Let the tool do the work. I can wiggle the tool back and forth a bit to kind of open the curve. That's fine. As long as these chips are coming out, that's great. Let's stop and check our progress. Okay, it looks like I'm going in the right direction. Now, what I'm going to do here is open up the curve just a little bit on the left hand side. This will give a little bit more clearance for the tool. Okay, I'm going to pull the tool out and that's okay as long as I'm up underneath the tool rest bar. <clears throat> I'm going to stop and look at my progress. It looks like I'm going a hair too deep. Everything looks just a hair too deep and that will hinder the possibility of getting another bowl here. So what I'd like to do is go shallower. So I'm going to bring the tool towards me, but now I can't get into that same slot that I've already got. So I'll adjust the banjo and now I'm going to go into the same slot but take wood off of the exterior of the smallest bowl and work towards center. <clears throat> you can see chips filing up here. That's okay, they're not hurting my progress. Okay, we're getting close. Nice and smooth. I'm wiggling the tool to just kind of open the curve. Let's stop, clean out the groove. Okay, I'm going to put the tool right back where I left off and this will tell you where you are. If you draw a straight line down the tool, I'm still about two inches from cutting through. So just draw a straight line and you can tell where you are. <coughs> Clean it out. I pulled the tool out just to clean it. I'm going to cut a little bit of this off of here and adjust the banjo. I moved the banjo in that direction to make the tool clear. I didn't want it rubbing on this side. Okay, we're almost all the way through. You can draw a line. It'll pretty much come out now. Okay, now let's take a look at that. Good thickness. I've gone just a hair deep, but that's probably going to be okay. 
You can see this little burn mark here. That was with the tool rubbing up against the wall there as I was going through. So what I did is I pushed the banjo away from that wall right there to stop the burn mark. And you can also see here there's a ledge where I was going too deep and I determined that when I got to that point and then I backed everything up, pulled the tool towards me and took a shallower tack towards center. Therefore, I can get another bowl out because had I kept that same trajectory, I wouldn't have been able to get another bowl. Okay, let's take the second bowl out now. I'm going to go to the medium curve of the regular set, get that good and tight in the handle. Let's take a measurement here to see how much room I've got. Well, I've got about two and a half inches before I come through the wood there, so there's plenty of room. Now I'd like to go this thickness below that elevation. That's what I'm shooting for. Let's put the blade in. I'm going to check for my center height just to make sure everything's good and tight. Good. Now let's set up to take the path I want. That looks like a good path right there. The more of these I do, the luckier I get. So let's start on that path right there. Okay, let's try this. Nice and easy. I'm going to touch the wood very softly. tool out, that cleans the kerf. That's exactly what I want. I'm looking at the trajectory. I can see the curve dark back there. What I'd like to do is I'd like to open up that kerf a bit right here on this left hand side. Watch what I do here. And this will allow the chips to come out a little easier. So I'm just going to nick off about an eighth of an inch there. You can see it. And I'm going to take that all the way down. Okay, now let's get our turret a little closer to the work. Go right back where I left off, all the way down there. There we go. pulled the tool out to clean it. Notice when I pull out, I'm always underneath the tool rest support. Let's go back to where I left off. Clean out again, nice and easy. And now I'm going to use really soft pressure to go all the way through the center. I can move the tool rest support to make it ride a little free. Just slowed up my RPMs because I'm almost close to being out. Okay, that's pretty close there. Let's check it. There we go. Beautiful. All right. That's exactly what I wanted. Trajectory wise. Good thickness, that's about the same thickness right there as it is right there. That's a good core. Let's talk about a couple of options that could have happened here. Let's say I wanted to take the largest section out first. 
However, that would require me to rechuck this piece to get after this bowl. So I elected to do it the easy way and that would take the little bowl out first because I'm in chucking position to get to the next bowl. Pretty common sense. Well, let's say I was going for a fancy nested bowl set just like this one here. I do it just the opposite. I take the largest one out, rechuck it, take the next largest one out, rechuck it, and I go over and over and over. Pretty monotonous. However, I find it's the best way to do it if I'm going for a fancy nested set, and this is the reason why. Let's say I had this chucked up just like this. I take a small bowl out, the next smallest bowl out, the next one out, the next one out, the next one out, and so on. And I've left here with maybe three quarters of an inch of wood here, maybe a half inch, and I don't have the guts to thread the needle to take another bowl. Therefore, I'm going to be missing this bowl out of the set. And everybody's going to miss that because this set is not proportional without this piece. Well, if I work largest to smallest, I take what I'm comfortable with out every time and rechuck it, and then when I run out of wood, nobody's going to miss the smallest bowl. That's the reason I would do it that way. One of the harder tasks you'll have with this tool is imagining a line and aiming this tool to get exactly what you want out of it. The more of these you do, the better you're going to get at it. But I don't want to leave it up into a mystery. There's actually a line that you can see if you're willing to look for it there. So if, if I'm coming down the way here and I've determined looking down there that I've gone too deep, the last thing I want to do is put a hole in my biggest bowl. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull everything out and readjust everything so I can go shallower basically by bringing the tool towards me and going shallower shallower towards center. That's going to be one of your most difficult things to do, but you have to put a couple hours into it to understand how to work this. The other thing you're going to worry about more than anything is putting the tool in consistently smooth. When you watch me work with this tool, I'm very consistent and steady and I'm pushing behind the tool, not pulling, but pushing and guiding it right through the gap. Okay, let's use one of these straight parting tools that comes with the small version of the tool. The thickness here isn't that much, so I won't be removing much wood. So I've got a bowl blank here, and instead of wasting the timber, putting my nice curve on the bowl, I'm going to use this parting tool, basically an inch from this surface here, put it in the turret with my tool rest support, get it close, and I'm going to plunge in a couple inches, and if you've ever parted side grain, you know it's not advisable without some type of support. This tool rest support offers that. So let's go ahead and try that and let's get something more useful than just a bowl blank here. Ramp it up to a comfortable speed. Get everything good and tight. I'm at the center line. So nice and soft. Come in here and just part about a two inch groove on the back of this bowl. Very steady, consistent pressure. Okay, that's good. Let's come around back here. Let's part this ring off and I'll get a nice little picture frame that I can use for another project. And this will just fall off now. I'm still about a half inch away. There we go. Turn this off there. There we are. All right. So, if you're so inclined, you've got a nice picture frame here that you can sand up and 
put something in. Cut a nice clean tin in here to fit in my chuck nicely. Let's go through this process one more time with a bigger bowl blank. I'm going to get one more bowl than I got on the other piece just because of its depth and its diameter. Now I'm solid here. I've got my screw center there that I had originally for the chucking device. Let's mark out where I'm going to core. These bowls again are going to be roughed out and returned for later. So I need a thickness on this bigger bowl about right there for the drying process. There's another bowl. There's another bowl. And let's say there's another bowl right there. So four bowls totally from this one blank. Now I'm going to remove the inner screw hole here and reveal the interior of the smallest bowl. There you go, the screw hole's gone. Now, this bowl is just a hair thick for the drying process, but that's okay. This is just for learning. I'm going to try to go this thickness below that elevation right there. So let's set up the tool. I'm going to use the short, small version of this tool, shortest curve. Okay, I've got the shortest curve here on the small blade set. Put it in the appropriate slot. Check for my center mark. I'm a little high. Drop the turret down. Crimp it in there good and tight. Now let's set up for the trajectory I need to make that. That looks about right, right there. Let's start her up. Let's take a bowl blank out. I'm going to slow up my RPM down to about 600 here. Let's lock the tool in. See if that breaks out right there. Yep, and there we go. Let's spin this one out. I'd rather break them out than let them fly around. Okay, that's a good thickness. I'll leave that one. Now, let's go to this other bowl here. And I'd rather not use this smaller, tighter curve for this bowl. It doesn't allow for that. Let's use the medium curve of the regular set. Loosen my support here. Put this in the appropriate slot. Again, I'm going to check for height, my elevation, make sure that's just right. Okay, for these larger bowls, notice my banjo has been perpendicular with a lathe bed. I'd like my banjo to be at an angle like this as long as I can get it. If the diameter of this bowl is too big, that isn't going to happen. But the reason for that is it gives me a larger footprint here. And what happens is it puts so much torque on the banjo that it can actually bend the cast iron. So by angling it like that, I get myself a lot more support. So let's go for bowl number two. Get everything good and tight. Nice, steady, consistent pressure.
Looks like I'm going in the right direction. Everything looks good. I want to open up the kerf a little bit here on the left-hand side to let chips flow out. There it is. I opened it up. Now, that'll allow chips to come out of that groove a lot better. Pulling it out to clean. A little more. You can see the chips coming out of the groove. That's a good sign. Everything looks good. I'm still a couple inches away. If I draw a straight line, still a couple inches away. Let's pull it out to clean. As long as I stay underneath the tool rest support, I'm good. Put it right back where I left off. Move the tool rest a little bit so it'll clear easily. Okay, we're pretty close. Okay, that's pretty much out. Let's shut her down. There we go. That's a good thickness all the way through for the drying process. Let's go get another bowl. And it looks to me that I could still manage using this blade. So let's keep it up. Make sure everything's good and tight. Lock in the tool. Come back out, get the trajectory we want. Looks like I've got a good two and a half inches, so plenty of room here. Let's get the trajectory I want here. Lock it in good and tight. My banjo is at an angle, that's good. Nice, steady, consistent pressure. I'm going to open up the kerf on the left hand side to let those chips clear out easier. You can see those chips coming out a lot better now. to clean out. Okay, let's go right back where I left off. Let's just kind of fishtail the tool all the way down. Clean it out. Check to see if I'm still good and tight. I am. Gonna clean out another time. inches away yet.
Clean it out again. One more time. Real close now. Okay, let's check that. Okay, and that's a good thickness as well. It's at least that thick right there. And I still have plenty of meat down there in the bottom. This is, all these bowls are ready for the drying process. Now the reason I did that in real time is I wanted to let you see what the possibilities are. It wasn't that difficult to do. The more of these you do, the luckier you get. Let's review on paper what's going on here. When I chuck up my bowl blank, I need a minimum of 40% of the total diameter to be tenon. I like 50% if I can get it. Also, when I'm coring bowls out, the longer the kerf here, the harder it is to get wood chips to come out. So what I'd like to do is nick off an edge and make a funnel shape so chips pile out through the centrifugal force of the lathe. Now if I've got off in the wrong direction, in the wrong trajectory, there's a possibility of creating a little cup here which will make chips clog up into the kerf area and it's going to slow your progress up considerably. So you don't want to do that. So always try to keep a positive curve for chips to flow out. Let's get on to something more technical. Let's put tenons on these crescent-shaped bowls that we took out of the main piece. I wouldn't put a tenon on these until they actually were dry, but let's consider these as dry. What I would do is just take this crescent shape, throw it right up against the chuck there, put it as close to center as you can, just like that. And then you're ready to go. There you go, that's the tenon for that bowl. Let's do another. Again, put it right as in the center as you can get it. There we go. Good large tenon here. There you go that easy. Well, let's get on to making a natural edge nested bowl set. What I've got here is a piece of California lilac. It's a very rare burl, hard as a rock. But my experience tells me that the harder, denser timbers core out more easily than the green ones because the green ones leave ribbons behind, whereas this one will leave a dirty, dusty chip and it's easier to core because it won't clog up our kerf. Now I'm going to use a two spur drive here, pound it into the dead center. By the way, the best burls to make nested bowl sets have a nice, evenly crowned surface here. Therefore, you're going to get more bowls than a flat surface. This isn't perfect, but it's okay. Let's put it in between centers. I'm just going to carve a bowl shape out of it, put a large tenon on it, and I'll show you the process of how I would do this. It's going to be quite a bit out of round, and you can tell by the sound how hard this wood is.
Okay, I want to balance my natural edge. So when it sits on the table, most of the edges are balanced. Just taking the path here to see what has to move. It's fairly balanced right now. Let me take a couple more passes and get a more of a bowl shape and then maybe have to make an adjustment. Check that out. I'm looking for high spots and low spots. It looks like this area is the highest portion of the bowl, so I'm going to have to lower that down just a bit. Let me remove this little nub here that's going to be in the way of that. Okay, this is the high section here. Let's drop that down. I'm going to have to break this nub off here. There we go. You can see it's a beautiful wood. Let's put that back. Let's find the high spot. This whole section here, we're going to just drop it about quarter of an inch maybe. Let's see how that looks. It's just a hair too high still right there. Let's drop it down. There we go. Let's see what that looks like. Okay, that'll just make it look nicer when it sits on the table. Now let's put a large tenon on it. Let's get a nice bowl shape. Okay, let's make sure my tenon's nice and clean. Good, that'll fit nicely in the chuck. Let's get a good close up of that tenon. Squeeze down good and hard. Now there's no gap in front of the face of the chuck and the wood. That's a good, solid, strong hold. Okay, I'm going to get a nice, clean surface over the exterior here, and then I'm not going to ever come back to it. I'm going to core out the interior right from there. A push cut to start. Got a 3 8 inch bowl gouge. like a good curve I've got. Let's see how clean the wood is. A little bit of torn grain here. Let's see what I can do with a shear scrape. I got to get this area pristine because I'm not going to want to cut back on it once I core out the interior.
Take a look at that. Yeah, that's sandable. That's much better. Okay, let's set up to take out the biggest core. Our natural edge is about eight inches in diameter, and I'm thinking about which blade is appropriate to take this largest core. Well, the micro system would probably work, but it's a very thin curved tool and probably have a tendency to vibrate in this very dense timber. So I'm going to use the small set of curves to achieve this goal, and I'm going to use the medium curve tool to take out that largest section. The straight blades or the straight curved blades of all the systems are good for taking cores out of very tall, thin vase-like structures or thin plate-like cores out of thin bowl blanks. Okay, let's put the blade through, put it in the appropriate slot. I'm going to check my height, get it right at the dead center. That looks good. Get it good and tight. Now I'm going to leave myself about a quarter inch wall thickness on this largest piece. Now I've got to be very careful going in because my wood is going to see wood, air, wood, air. So I've got to take a very soft, easy plunge. Get my planned curve out. Let's go in. Lock the tool in. It's locked in good. Okay, I'm going to pull out and take a look at my path to see if I'm going in the right direction. Everything looks good. Looks like I'm going on the right path. I've left myself about a quarter inch wall thickness there. I can trim off just a hair more to open up the curve. Let's do that. out to clean it out. Let's go back in where I left off. Clean out one more time. Let's check Take a look one more time, make sure I'm going and taking the deepest plunge that I can get without going through the bottom. That looks good. Go right back down to the bottom. That high pitch sound you hear is the blade hitting on the inner portion of the biggest bowl. I don't want to let that hit too hard, otherwise I'll split it. But I'm real close to coming out now. I'm going to loosen my handle out a little bit and extend the blade so it can go further past the tool rest support. So I dropped it out about a, a half inch. So I've extended the blade, therefore it'll go deeper into the bowl. Lock it in. Got my turret a little closer to the work.
Clean it out. Okay, I'm real close. There it is. Whoop, there we go. All right, looks good. Got a good deep plunge, probably about a half inch from going through. That's exactly what I wanted. Okay, now let's chuck this piece up after I finish the interior of this. I'm going to cut that all clean and get that ready for sanding. Then we'll chuck this piece up and do the process all over again. Okay, got a 3 8 inch bowl gouge to clean out the interior of this, get it sandable. Let's check my wall thickness. Just a hair thick here. Check that. Okay, that feels good. Let's finish up the bottom. Got a half inch gouge here with the traditional grind. Let's put a nice curve in here. Okay, let's check that curve, check my depth. Okay, I like that. That's ready for sanding. Okay, I'm back to my two-prong spur. I'm going to put it back in the original center. Put the tailstock in the dead center as close as I can get. Yeah, I missed it just a bit. Okay, let's put a tenon on it. Remove a little bit of this material so it won't bottom out in the chuck. Okay, let's flip it around and core it. Let's clean up the exterior now and get that ready for sanding. Put a shear scrape over it just to refine it. All right, that looks good. 
I'm about seven inches diameter now, and I think I'm going to use the micro set to achieve the rest of the piece. Now, I want to remove the center mark there for my spur drive because I want to see where the inner portion of the smallest bowl is and that'll help me know where I can core to. Now instead of rechucking up each piece over and over, let me show you a method that I have found that makes this job a lot less monotonous. Okay, let's remove that spur drive damage. Hopefully it doesn't go too deep. Okay, let's take a look at that. Yeah, that looks okay. That's the, let's just call that the inner portion of the smallest bowl. Let's set up to take the rest of the cores out. Now I'm going to use the medium curve of, of the micro set here to take, basically plunge down to see where the biggest core will be relieved. Put it in the appropriate slot. Get it on the center height right there. There we go, good. Let's lock the tool up. There we go. Again, I'm going to take about, think about leaving a quarter inch wall thickness. That looks good. Very easy, steady plunge. It looks like I'm plunging fairly deep with this medium blade. Let's think about using the tighter curve here. Let's go back to it. This is the tighter curve. So the medium curve wasn't quite the blade I wanted. Let's take a look at this. This might be a more appropriate. Yeah, that looks good. Let's lock the tool under. This will get me around the corner better. Okay, I want to pull out and take a look. I want to look at my trajectory. Make sure I'm going in the right path. Okay, that looks good. I think if I continue on that, I'll take my deepest plunge. But instead of breaking this whole section out, I'm going to start another curve here and do the same thing and then just get smaller and smaller. And you'll see what's going on here in a second. This will keep me from having to rechuck each piece over and over. Okay, let's check that. Now I'm looking at that plunge. It looks good. I'm leaving myself 
uh, about three inches before I part the whole thing off. But I'm in the right trajectory to make all this work. Let's go to another bowl. Very easy, steady. Going a hair bit too deep on this one. Let me take a different path. Okay, that looks good. Now let's go to another bowl here. This may be the last one. I believe it is because I'm pretty deep right there, so I better just go with one more bowl. Okay, let's take a look at that trajectory there. Yep, I'm going to give myself plenty of room. So let's just part this little bowl off right now. There we go. That's plenty of thickness for another bowl. Okay, now I'm going to do the same thing with this one. Going just a hair thin here. I think I need to take a little deeper plunge, so I'll make that adjustment as I'm going down. So I'm going to go just a bit deeper on this one. Okay, let's check that one. Good, I've left myself about a half inch there, that's good. Now, that looks pretty good, that trajectory I can pretty much keep the same. Okay, I want to stop and check on this one. The curve's getting a little long there, it's hard to see. Let's make sure I'm going in the right trajectory. That looks good. I don't want to go too deep here because it could harm this bowl. So it's got to thread the needle just right. It should be close to coming out there. Let's check that. Just a bit more. Okay, how'd we do? All right, good thickness right there. Got another bowl. Now, I've got plenty of thickness between here and the chuck, so that should be good. But I've got to extend my tool out a little bit further so it can travel further along the path. Take it out about a half inch. It's getting hit, the tool handle is hitting right here. By extending that, I can get the tool in deeper.
Okay, check my center height again. Now, let's take this other bowl out. That looks good. Put her back in where I left off. Clean it out. I'm going to clean it out one more time. A lot of build up there. Okay, check my trajectory. Don't want to lose it now. Everything seems all right. Clean it out again. Pretty close here. I still have to extend the handle a little bit more because the tool handle's hitting. Let's back it up a bit so I can get a little bit more travel. That's all I'll need right there, a quarter inch probably, and this piece will come right on through. You'd like to cut those pretty far through because you don't want to blow a hole out of the bottom by tearing it. There we go. Beautiful. Got a good depth there. Plenty of bowl left to chuck up. Okay, I've just got an old bit of wood here that I've hauled out the center that I'm going to use as a tension drive. And here's one of our crescents here. And the crescent has a little broken surface right here at the dead center. And that's why I've hauled out this area because I don't want it to hit on that area. I want it to run on the smooth portion of the interior of the bowl. So let's throw that up against that chunk of wood there. Put that as in the dead center as close as I can get it. Let's check that. Yep, and now I can put a tenon on that one. Just a little tiny tenon here. Don't need much to grip on. Okay, that's it. That's the tenon for that bowl. Let's see if we can't do all of these crescents on this same bit of wood. Try to put that right in the dead center. Just a bit. There we go. Let's try that. There we go. Okay, that's ready. Let's trim up a little bit here. There we go. That'll work. Got two more here. You can see that I have a little, look, looks like a ten in there now. That's where I changed direction on that one core and I went deeper. Had I gone in that same direction, I would have had too thin of a bowl here and would have lost the set. Plenty of room to make it up. There we go. Dead center. Put a little tent in here.
Okay, let's see if that little one will fit there. Here's our littlest core. Good thickness all around. Again, you can see where I changed direction. I was going too thin on this piece. I went deeper. Let's see if that'll fit on there. Yes, it will. Okay, let's put that right in the dead center. Delicate little piece there. Okay, a nice little tenon on this. And I have a chuck that'll fit that little tenon. There we go. Okay, and then I will finish these bowls up with a gouge, sand them, and I'd have a nice, well-turned nested bowl set. Well, I hope you agree. It's not a bad way to save some beautiful timber. Well, thanks for watching, everybody, and good luck with the tool. I hope you find it as rewarding and as useful as I do. Let me show you how I grind these tools. It's a very simple tool to grind. There's something you should know though. On the top of the tool is a very thin veneer of high speed steel. So you do not want to grind over the top of the edge here. What I do is I take a stone and I push it up against the sharp edge there, leaving myself a nice fresh burr. However, there's going to be a time when you're coring, you might hit some dirt or a nail and you'll have to re-grind these on the grinding wheel. Let me show you how I do that. Okay, on the front here, you can see that shiny area there. That's our thin veneer. That's why we don't want to sharpen over the top like this. On the front of the tool is basically two 45 degree angles. I'd like to keep those just like they are. And on the front here is about a 70 degree angle. Let's keep that at 70 degrees and no sharper because it becomes aggressive if it's any sharper than that. So if I need to regrind here, I'm just going to act like a, the front of a scraper blade. That side's done, and that side's done. This is a brand new sharp tool. Over the years, I've had the ability to bend a couple of these blades, and the main reason for bending the blade was a buildup of heat from rubbing the tool on the side of the bowl while I worked with it, and you don't want to do that. Well, if you're finding that you're building up a lot of heat, I would get a spray bottle and spray right down into the kerf, and that'll cool the tool off and lessen the likelihood of bending a blade. You may have noticed while I've been working today that I have a much shorter handle than what comes with the system. I prefer a shorter handle. What comes with the system is a very long handle. What I do is I cut them in half and therefore I have two. The problem with a longer handle is you have the ability to let the tool sag and that's definitely what you don't want. I find a shorter handle gives me much more control. I want to show you how I hold the handle while I work. I've employed numerous ways of holding on to the tool while I work. There is no correct way to do it, whatever's comfortable. While you've watched me work today, I've held the tool all the way back here. I've had my hand up here underneath the tool rest support, and that's a habit I've had before Kel McNaughton built this support area here. So I've always kept my hand there to hold the tool up underneath the tool rest support. And I've also used my hand out here. And when I'm working with thinner blades, I have my hand sometimes over the top of the blade. And all that does is dampen vibration if the wood is really dense and the tool is thin.